Ephesians chapter 6. <clears throat> Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you and we give you all praise today. Now help us, Holy Spirit, to make these truths simply explained. Help me to break it down so that we will all be able to grasp the truth of the statements that are being made in Scripture. We thank you for years to hear today. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How to put on the armor of righteousness in order to stand against and overcome the lies, the tricks, and the schemes of the devil. How many of y'all know that Satan is real? Pestilence, the source is Satan. Did y'all hear what I just said? And you have to stand against it. In Psalms 91, it says, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and strength, my God in whom I trust. And then he goes on to say, and listen to me carefully, no harm shall befall thee, only with thine eyes shall you see the reward of the wicked. He goes on to say that you shall be delivered from the noisome pestilence, that lurking disease that is out there. If you make the Lord your God your habitation, your refuge, then you don't have anything to worry about. He will keep you in perfect peace. Keep your mind on him. In Ephesians chapter 6 in verse 10, Paul in his letter to the church at Ephesus, as well as us today, says these words, finally, my brethren, be strong, be strong in the Lord and in the power, Kratos power of his might. And I've said in the sermons or the messages previous to this, this one, in order to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty Kratos power, we are told we must put on, everybody say put on, put on the whole armor of God. We are to put on the whole armor of God in order to stand against and overcome the wild tricks and schemes of the devil. And we found out on last week the first spiritual armor that we are told to put on mentally is the armor of truth. Now, let me share this with you. In verse 14, Paul says, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. A more clear instruction for us today would be to simply say, stand therefore, arming yourself with truth. And so the question we tried to ask on last week is how do we arm ourselves with truth and we found out that truth is found in scripture. Now listen to this, Jesus makes this statement 
relative to truth. In John 17 and 7, Jesus in his prayer to the Father says, sanctify, separate, protect them through thy truth. And then he says, thy word is truth. And then in John chapter 8, Jesus makes this statement. And this is so important. If you continue in my word, he uses the personal pronoun, my. He says, then are you my disciples indeed. And then he says in verse 32, and you shall know the truth. Continue in my word then you are my disciples indeed. Continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. On last week, we asked the question, free from what? Free from what? And the truth is, he makes us free from the lies of Satan. Jesus goes on to say in John 8 and 44, please listen to this. Jesus says this concerning Satan. In verse 44, he says he was a murderer from the beginning. And he stands not in the truth. There is no truth in him. When he speaks, he speaks nothing but lies because he is a liar and the father of it. Lies. Whatever mental picture Satan is trying to give you concerning your future, and it's always a mental picture surrounded around your failure, your destruction, your demise. Are y'all hearing me? Satan never gives you a picture that's consistent with the word of God. He always gives you a mental picture that, that uh, at its base is fear. I don't know how I'm going to make it. I don't know how things are going to work out. And always Satan gives you the, the suggestion that things are going to go sour for you. What you've got to realize is what he tries to present to you is nothing but a lie. You've got to make up in your mind, and that's the battleground, that you are not going to give in to the lies of the enemy. I don't care what his report is. You've got to believe the report of the Lord. Say amen. amen. Now let me say this to help you out when it comes to you discovering truth and then standing on it. In Deuteronomy 17 and in Deuteronomy 19, the scriptures teach us, now listen to me, at the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established as a truth. Now listen, because I'm going to say something that if, you, if you're not paying attention, you'll miss. It does not say at the mouth of two or three scripture, let every word be established. It says, at the mouth of two or three witnesses. In other words, now please hear me. If you get three scriptures that I have said concerning your healing, that's one witness because I'm one person. Yet I have said it three or four different times and you read it three or four. Well, who's saying it? I'm saying it. I constitute one witness. But if you get what Leota said, 
and Minister or Pastor Murdoch said, and then what I said, and they all agree, that's three witnesses. So when you begin to stand on the word of God, get three different witnesses or three different scripture, two to three different scripture from different people. Say amen. amen. That way you are, in, you are consistent with what the word teaches us we must look for at the mouth of what? Two or three witnesses, let every word be established. We have Matthew, who is a witness. We have Mark, who is a witness. We have Luke, who is a witness. And we have John, who is a witness. Say amen. Those are four different witnesses, but they are witnessing to the same statement that came out of the mouth of Jesus, which means we got four different people witnessing the truth of what God said through Jesus Christ our Lord. Somebody say amen. amen. So now here's how this works. In your sphere of authority, when you are being attacked by Satan with some ungodly suggestion, and then you have what God says in his word, you become the establishing witness. You become the person whose will will manifest in your life. You can either choose to believe God or you can be deceived and you can believe the enemy. The choice is whose? Yours. It's your choice. Stand on the truth of God's word, agree with God, and watch God manifest his truth in your life. And somebody ought to say amen. amen. And so today we want to talk about the second spiritual armor that we are told to put on and is the armor of righteousness. Now please follow along with me. Ephesians 6, 14 says, and having on the breastplate of righteousness or putting on righteousness. Now please pay attention. In this passage in Ephesians 6 and 14, righteousness, and you might want to write this down, is acting, say acting. It is acting in accordance with the moral law of God. This is not imputed righteousness, something that you are given, which Paul alone teaches. Did y'all hear what I just said? This righteousness in this passage deals with a righteousness that is based on acting in accordance with the moral law of God. Say the moral law. Okay. Now let me teach you. There are in the scriptures three types of law. The Bible, your scripture, teaches three types of law. And let me give you those quickly. Number one, there is civil law. Please write this down. Meaning law governing society and how Israel was to function as a nation. They were under what is called a theocracy, which is God ruled. We are not under a theocracy today. We have embraced what is called democracy, and that is people ruled. The majority rules. That can at times be a problem, because when the majority is wrong, amen, the minority suffers. Did y'all hear what I just said? And so, uh, civil law, let me give you an example. In Leviticus, it says, 
that they were not supposed to allow a witch to exist, that a witch was to be taken and burned. In America, there are all kind of witches that are on corners, and you can go in there and get your fortune read. Those are nothing but witches. The reason why we don't drag them out and burn them and put them to the stake and burn them is because we are not under the civil law which was given to the nation of Israel through Moses. We are under democracy. We have a constitution. That constitution sometimes guarantees the rights of wicked people. Did y'all hear what I just said? So, so under civil law, Israel could do certain things that once they became subject to the other nations, they could no longer do. And so the civil law and scriptures was specifically for the nation of Israel. Do y'all understand that? Then there was the ceremonial law, meaning laws governing purity and ritual cleansing, laws governing the feast and how you were to function. These ceremonial laws were mostly connected to how they were to worship. When God first came on the scene in Exodus 20, he said, don't you dare make an altar out of hewed rock. In other words, if you had an altar, it was supposed to be out of the earth, pulled up out of the earth. And then you use that as your place of sacrifice. Later on, God gave them different instruction through Moses on how the altar was to be. Are y'all hearing me? What I'm trying to get you to understand is ceremonial law over time can change. Uh, Jesus, the Israelites or the Jews during Jesus' day thought that the place to worship was Jerusalem. And Jesus changed the whole thing when he says, God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. It's not about the place. Say amen. So, so you can worship God anywhere uh, as long as you do it in spirit and in truth. And when we talk about worshiping God, we really mean obeying God because obeying God is really the highest act of worship we can give to God. You hollering and screaming is great, but if you really want to please God, obey him. Jesus said it like this. If you really love me, keep my commandments. So obedience is always better than what? Sacrifice. It's not about killing goats and sheep and all that stuff, lambs. It's not about that. It's about offering up to God the sacrifice of praise, which is the fruit of your lips, giving thanks. It's a heart that God is looking for, not necessarily acts. And so ceremonial law governs purity, rituals, and laws of religion. And then lastly, and this is most important, moral law. What is moral law? Moral law are the laws that apply to all people, say all people. throughout all time and eternity. Laws of morality are given by God. They reveal what God desires of us to do and not to do. Now please hear me, when you talk about whether a person is a righteous person, Righteousness is based on an individual's adherence to the moral law, not the civic or the ceremonial, but the moral. Say amen. amen. Just because you break a speed limit going down the street, you drive in 35 and it's 30, that doesn't mean you're a wicked person. It means you just made a mistake. Say amen. amen. 
That's civil law. Moral law is to lie about it when you're asked how, fa how fast you were going. Talk to me. Are y'all hearing me? Gossiping is a violation of moral law. It says, thou shalt not bear false witness. Gossip means you don't know the truth. You just saying something that you what? Heard. Talk to me, somebody. And so you're violating the moral law when you gossip, when you lie, when you steal. Are y'all hearing me? When you covet. Where do we find the basis of moral law? It is found in Exodus chapter 20. Verses 3 through 17. The first thing God did when he delivered Israel out of Egyptian bondage, he made this announcement. I am the Lord thy God, which has delivered you out of the house of bondage. And the first thing he said is, have no other gods but me. I'm your God and you are my people. And then God begins to give them moral law that was to govern them as a people. But not just them. Moral law is for all humanity. Moral law is found in Exodus 20 verses 3 through 17 known as the Ten Commandments or the Ten Sayings. And then moral law is found in Micah chapter 6 verse 8 the prophet asked the question what do I need to do to please the most high God and he asked the question should I kill thousands of sacrifices do I need to give my firstborn for my sin and then the prophet or God speaks to the prophet and he says this is not what I require. You know what I require. And then he says to do justly, to love mercy, to be merciful, and to walk humbly. Talk to me, somebody. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Listen to me. Moral law is found in Micah chapter 6, verse 8, when he says do justly, be just in your dealings towards people. Love mercy, stop being harsh and love mercy. Stop condemning the guiltless. One time Jesus was with his disciples and they were going through a grain field and they were picking on the Sabbath, taking the husks off the, the corn and eating the corn because they were hungry. Talk to me. And the, the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, came and said, why do you allow your disciples to do what is not lawful? And Jesus helped them. He said, have you not read? Have you not read how David went into the temple because he was hungry, him and his fellas? And he took the showbread, which was only lawful for the priest to eat, and he took it and he ate it because he was hungry. He said, listen to me, stop looking at what you see and understand God's law is for the liberation of his people, not their bondage. Amen. He says the Sabbath was not made, or man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for man. And then he said, but go learn this saying. Why are you talking? Go learn what this means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. I began to think about that passage. I said, what do you mean? And, 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 and what Jesus was saying is the only person that you can give mercy to is fellow people. You can't be merciful towards God. God ain't never did nothing wrong. But you can sacrifice to God and hear what God says. I'd rather mercy than sacrifice. Keep your sacrifices and learn how to treat each other. Y'all didn't hear that. Stop worrying about what you're going to kill on the altar and love your brother 
and treat them right. Say amen. That means more to me than you killing up an animal and then going and seeing your brother and spitting them in, in, in their face. Talk to me, somebody. Listen to me. What Jesus was trying to tell us, or excuse me, what the prophet was trying to tell us is we need to do justly. We need to love mercy. And we need to walk humbly. That's moral law. Say moral law. And I've always said, if you can't remember the ten, remember the three. Remember them three. Do justly. Love mercy. And then walk humbly. Do y'all hear what I'm saying today? And then in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, when Jesus was sharing with us, he said this, he says, what you would that men do to you, do also unto them. For this is the law and the prophets. Here Jesus says, I'm going to teach you the whole law and the prophets. One of, one of the stories in reading, you will find that there are, there were two prophets in the days of Jesus that were, two rabbis, excuse me, in the days of Jesus that were very prominent in their teaching, Rabbi Shammai and Rabbi Hillai. These two different uh, prophets, or excuse me, rabbis, teachers, many people came to them to seek their wisdom. It just so happened that one day a Gentile came and said, teach me the law. Teach me the law of God. Teach me the law of Moses and the law of the prophets. And Heli said to him, do unto others. Listen, as you would have them do unto you. Now, he got that statement from Jesus. Say amen. Because Jesus is the one who said what you would that men do to you, do also unto them. This is the law and the prophets. All what the law teaches, all what the prophets call people to is surrounding the moral law of God. Listen to me. God is not concerned about what you wear. He's concerned about how you treat people. Do y'all hear what I'm saying? God is not concerned about outward. He's concerned about the inward. Please hear me when I say this. You will not be judged just based on what you do, but you will be judged based on the motive behind what you have done. Some people do it to be seen of men. And Jesus said, you have your reward. In other words, you got to do what you do from a heart of love towards who? God. And not to be seen of men. Some people just want to impress people. And that's not what it's all about. It's about your love for God and doing what you do because you love God. I love people because God loves me. Listen to me. We didn't first love God. God loves us. And God says, the way you love me is by loving people. You can love God and hate people. That's, that's, that is not reality. That, but that's what religion teaches. And Jesus never came to teach us religion. He came to show us the heart of the Father God. If you are to walk in moral law, you've got to love people. God says he loves the whole world that he gave. No one is excluded from your obligation to love humanity. In, in Leviticus chapter 19, talk to me somebody. In verse 17, Moses says, do not avenge yourself. Did y'all hear what I just said? Do not avenge yourself and, and do not bear a grudge against your neighbor but love your neighbor as yourself. And then it says, and I am the Lord thy God. In other words, God put a stamp on that one. 
He says, stop trying to get even with people. You, you know, stop trying to talk about payback and how you can hurt somebody else because they hurt you. Do not avenge yourself. Vengeance, the scripture says, is mine. In talking about God, I will repay. Let God fight your battles. Stop you trying to fight battles. You pray for them who despitefully use you. This is the heart of moral law. Moral law stops us from striking out at people who have hurt us, but it causes us to get on our knees and pray for them that they would not continually be used by Satan. Now, I know this is hard to hear, but it's what God says. And if we're going to be with him, we've got to walk in moral law. Say amen, somebody. Where am I at? Listen, not only in Leviticus 19 and verse 17, in Leviticus 19 verse 34, it says, be careful, talk to me, how you treat strangers. Listen, God says your neighbor in 17, but then he turns around and says, oh, and by the way, those people who are not Israelites, but just hanging out around you, be careful how you treat them. They're the strangers. He says, because you were at one time a stranger. In other words, you didn't always have it going on. So stop acting like you have. Because God found us all in the, in the muck and mire and, and raised us all up. Talk to me, somebody. And so you've got no reason to throw your nose up at somebody who is still struggling. Talk to me. He said, at one time you were in their seat. He said, so you be careful how you treat the stranger. And then he said this, and love the stranger as yourself. And then he puts a staple on it. He says, because I am the Lord your God. Not only are we supposed to love our neighbors, but we're supposed to love strangers. People who we come in contact with that we don't even know. You treat everybody, say everybody with dignity and respect. That's moral law. Talk to me somebody. That ain't based on your income. It ain't based on your job position. It's based on moral law which God gives. Treat everybody with dignity and respect. I know I'm telling you the truth today. Say amen. And so moral law is the law that God expects us all to live by. It is also called the law of nature. In other words, moral law is written on the hearts of everybody. But here's the truth. God is the one who wrote it on everybody's heart. And then as we live, we begin to sear our conscience to the truth. If you wouldn't sear your conscience, you would be convicted by the moral law that's written in your heart. And you would stop treating folk like dirt. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you is moral law. It comes from God. It would eradicate racism. It would eradicate sexism. It, it would eradicate slavery, oppression. Every ill which is in society would be wiped out if we would live by moral law, which is what God expects us to live by. Put on righteousness means learn how to walk in the light of the moral law of God. Now, why is this important? Now, here's the truth. Because in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6 and 7, it tells us we must strive to live righteous. This ain't about being. This is living. Say living. We must strive to live righteous lives in order to keep, in order to keep from falling into the condemnation, reproach, and snare of Satan. When you live loose lives, all it does is give Satan the right to accuse you. Now please hear me. 
Condemnation means guilt. Reproach means to defame, rail at, chide, ridicule, taunt, and mock. Snare means to trap or noose, to hang somebody. If you don't understand, you will not be able to stand against the attacks of Satan if you are living a sinful life, you fooling yourself. You cannot tell Satan, get thee behind me, when you got one of his demons living in your bedroom. He will look at you and say, have you lost your mind? You got the demon of alcoholism sitting right there in your house, or the demon of drug addiction, or the demon of, of, of pornography, or the demon of whatever. You got it sitting in your house, it's your partner. You can't cast me out because you've given me legal right to be in your, your life and destroy your life because of who you are trafficking with. Somebody needs to say amen. amen. This is why righteous living shuts off the condemnation of the devil. Amen. If you're not trying and striving to live righteous and you are living loose lives, it keeps you under the condemnation of Satan. What does that mean? Anytime he get ready, he can come in and destroy and blow you up. And here's what most Christians are doing. Because they don't understand they need to live right in order to shut off the condemnation of Satan. They are dealing with the fires that Satan keeps setting in their lives. They go from one fire to the next fire to the next fire to the, you know what will stop all that? Holy living, say amen. amen. Boy, I, 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 I just want you to understand, if you're going to stand against the, the tricks and the snares of Satan, you got to live right. You got to strive to live right. You got to resist sin. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Say amen. Well, I'm telling the truth. And see, we want, we want to have it, you know, the easy way. Okay, you just want to say, I'm, I'm, I got imputed righteousness. So it don't matter how I live. What it does to Satan. <laughs> Y'all better hear me. If you think you're going to heaven anyhow, while you're here on earth, you're going to be in hell. Because you have not cut off the way Satan enters into our lives. When you live righteous, you cut his neck off. And then when he condemns you, and you've been delivered from, you can say, that's not me, I don't know who you're talking about. Get out, Satan, in the name of Jesus. Listen, when you have stopped, and I mean, show sure enough, stop and been delivered from the craziness that was a part of your life, then you have boldness to stand against the enemy. But if you're still dabbling in the, 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 the stuff, and you know I want to use another word, get your mind out the gutter. <laughs> Hear what I'm saying. If you still in the muck and the mire and the doo doo, is that a better word? When you come out playing in the doo doo, you smell like doo doo. The only way you to get clean the doo doo is to go in there and take a shower, and the shower is called living in accordance with the moral law of God. When you're living in sin, I said in sin, it is impossible to stand against the attacks of Satan. This is what we don't tell people. We tell them, put on the whole armor of God. Just put on the whole armor. Just put it on. Put on the whole armor. And then they say, okay, I got the armor of God on. And they got wicked lives. And they will not stand against the... And see, here's the deal. Satan ain't attacking those folks he's already oppressing. You already walking oppressed. You already bound. Why would Satan waste his time 
to attack you. You are living delusional. You've got to clean it up. Say clean it up. Clean it up. Yeah, God still wants us to walk in holiness. Walk in righteousness. Say amen. amen. Well, let me close this. Let me close this. Remember what I said. When you are living in sin, it is impossible to stand against the attacks of Satan. you got to clean it up. You cannot continue to embrace demonic activity, satanic activity, which violates your moral law. And think you can stand against the attacks of Satan. You're deceiving yourself. Now listen to me. There are two portions of scriptures that drive home our need to live righteous. I said what? Live righteous. Everybody say live righteous. Live righteous. You see, Paul's teaching on imputed righteousness has, has been twisted and given people the idea that it don't matter how they live long as they accept Jesus as Lord and personal Savior. Well, let me help you. It do matter. It, I said what? It does matter. You better live right, and you better strive to live right according to moral law. Listen, ceremonial law, we even have that stuff in church now. Here, this is ceremonial. This collar, this black suit, God don't care what you wear as long as you ain't trying to entice and tip somebody. Say amen. Talk to me somebody. That's ceremonial. You can't come into church unless the women wear pants and men, or excuse me, women wear dresses and men wear pants. God can care less about pants and, and dresses. That's ceremonial. God concerned about moral. Don't come into church acting a fool. Say amen. Stop trying to entice and tempt. Say amen. amen. Do y'all hear me? You got to be concerned about moral law. Because if you, if you don't, and you just say, well, I'm, I got imputed righteousness, Satan will continually wear you out. That's why we have so many, so few victories in people's lives. Is because they, they don't understand they got to cut off the source. And you do it by righteousness. When you are living righteous, let, let me just share this with you. Your countenance changes. When you've been living in sin, and then you finally make the decision, you know what? I'm tired of that. I don't want to live that way no more. I want to live in obedience to God. What happens? Your countenance changes. Listen, I mean for real. Your whole attitude and your countenance and your disposition changes. And listen to me, you become lovable. Amen. Say amen. amen. You become somebody that the people want to hang around because you are the light of the world. Amen. Say amen. amen. And, and the scripture said, let your light shine that men might see your what? Good works. You showed them your wickedness. Now it's time to show them your righteousness. Um, do y'all hear what I'm saying? People get offended over nothing. And offense will always keep you tied to Satan. It's a trap of the enemy. Listen to me carefully. These two scriptures, John chapter 3, verses 19 through 21. Listen to what it says. And this is the condemnation or guilt. This is the guilt. This is Jesus talking in John chapter 3 verse 19. And this is the condemnation or the, the guilt and the judgment. That light is coming to the world. And Jesus is referring to himself. He says I'm the light that has come into the world. But then he says 
Men love darkness rather than light. Men would rather do wrong than right. Men are more pulled to Satan than they are to God. He says, the reason I can say this is because their deeds were evil. It's your lifestyle that is a reflection of whose child you are. Did, did y'all hear me? For everyone that doth evil hateth the light. Neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. When you get into the light and you begin to see how wicked you really are, if you don't run from the light, then you'll stay in the light and you'll begin to change. But most people run. They hide out. Why? Because they don't want to be under condemnation. Listen to what he says. But he that doth truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be made manifest that they are done in God. Jesus is saying when you change and you embrace righteousness, you'll want to be in the truth all the time. You want to know what God says so you can align your life to what God says in his moral law. Say amen somebody. And then 1 John chapter 3 and I hope y'all writing these scriptures down or go to the internet and listen to the message so that you can get them and you can read them for yourself. 1 John chapter 3, this is 1 John who was a witness of Jesus. He says, little children, let no man deceive you. Let no man what? Deceive you. He that doth righteousness is righteous even as he Jesus is righteous if you live your life in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ that is called righteous living seek first not just the kingdom but his righteousness in verse 10 he says in this <coughs> the children of God are made clear and the children of the devil. Whoever does not righteousness, who doesn't purpose to live righteous, is not of God. I don't care if they say they are Christian. If you don't purpose to live righteous, you are not of God. Neither he that loveth not his brother. One of the surefire ways you'll know when a person is a wicked person but just confessing Christianity is that they still have hatred in their heart towards their fellow man. Listen, listen. They'll hate you if you don't agree with them in every religious or, or, or biblical concept or ideal. Some of this mess is just, just that. Listen, but they will hate you Oh, we can't have fellowship because you don't believe like I believe. Well, wait a minute now. Is that God? Is that the moral law? No, that's not. How can you hate your brother and say you're walking in the light? You cannot hate people and be God's child. And with that, let church say amen. amen. Come on.